using destruction to create. These are pretty pictures, right? Videos are interesting and scientifically valuable a little bit, but what's more important is making sense of this, is extracting the data out of it. Taking the horns from the bull. Studying sea turtles. All the species of sea turtles we deal with are threatened or endangered. Funding for this program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Sue and Edgar Wachenheim III, and contributions to this station. Hi, I'm Mike Zeman. Thanks for watching SciTech Now. What if we told you that you could make the most detailed 3D image of almost anything you wanted? The only catch, you had to destroy it first. It's called laser ablation technology. It's amazing, and it's happening right here in central Pennsylvania. A laser isn't a typical tool for the agriculture industry, but Ben Hall and his state college-based company, L4IS, don't have a typical origin story. I'm not a biologist. I actually abhorred biology in, uh, <laughs> in high school, although I'm very uh, ashamed of that now. I think it's fascinating. Hall was working with lasers at the Penn State Applied Research Lab when crop scientists came to him with the question, could lasers help them cut samples from a root? What they were doing over in the horticulture department was they were cutting these under a microscope, really, really thin little slices, about 100 microns, which is about the thickness of a piece of paper. You know, with the razor blade, you have a lot of human error, um, crushing it, tearing it, cutting it crooked, too thick. Uh, but it's a very slow process, and they would end up on the usable slices, which they'd get about three to five per hour. Not only did the laser work, it could churn out 11 samples a second. The collaboration led to a grant from the National Science Foundation that led to another opportunity. The grant had me cutting like 2,000 of these roots and putting the little pieces into a vial and then trudging across campus to, to give it to them. But I was just thinking, if I could just image it here, then I wouldn't have to walk across campus and I could just email the files. So instead of cutting samples, Hall decided to destroy one by slowly pushing it through the laser sheet and recording it with a high magnification lens. And it was the next morning, I was thinking like, well, each, each frame in this video represents essentially a slice of this object. If I could just find a way to take out the frames and then stack those frames up, you know, be able to reconstruct the three-dimensional route. By the time I was finished eating breakfast, I found two programs to do it uh, that were free. And there in front of me was this rotating three-dimensional model of a route. The images you were looking at were all created the same way. Hall and his partners patented the process. It's called laser ablation tomography. It creates a high-resolution 3D digital structure by photographing the original sample as a laser vaporizes it slice by slice. This is a scan created from the back half of a yellow jacket. It shows subtle textures and connective tissue. You can even peel off individual layers for a virtual dissection revealing internal structures and organs. This is the largest image Hall has produced, a hummingbird from beak to tail. These are pretty pictures, right? Videos are interesting and scientifically valuable a little bit, but what's more important is making sense of this, is, is extracting the data out of it. The speed and accuracy of laser ablation is already helping scientists analyze plant structure to interpret DNA. They'll grow 500 plants with gene A turned off and one with gene uh, A turned on, and we'll scan through those and we'll um, get the data and then we apply machine learning algorithms and pattern recognition um, to, to then map out these different things that they want to see. The technology is already being used by researchers at Penn State to help develop crops that can grow in dry, low nutrient soils. It's also helping them understand complicated interactions. This sample shows the root, the soil, and everything in it. The bright colors you see correspond to different chemicals. Yeah, to the legs. Analysis like this could help farmers cut back on pesticides and fertilizer. But Hall thinks there are even deeper discoveries on the horizon, molecular discoveries that could unlock clues about the building blocks of life. It's just like letters of the alphabet. Uh, there's 26 of them, and there's probably a similar amount of uh, chemical elements that we're constructed out of. Um, but then the words that they form, you know, there are 10,000 words. Uh, we had 26 letters, but the way they put together is important. So looking at 
in trying to determine which one of those 10,000 you're looking at, um, that's that's the harder part, but it's, you know, the, it's a frontier. It's really cool to try to figure that out. Grabbing the bull by the horns is a pretty popular saying, but for safety reasons, some farmers would rather not. Up next, Science Friday shows how some geneticists are trying to grab the horns from the bull. How are ya? Nice to see ya. Nice to see ya, my friend. How are ya? You good? Yeah, I know. So this is a uh, spotty guy. Yeah, he's very friendly. So normally his horns would be growing at here and here, but you can see that, that they're not growing. This is, um, this guy's called Buri. He has a slightly different spotting pattern, but also no horns. And so these are the stars of the show. Yes, the two bulls that have been um, genome edited. So we've tweaked that gene so that they no longer grow horns. As a geneticist and animal breeder, Dr. Allison Van Enenum doesn't see a cow the way that most people do. Things like the, the health of the animal, the reproductive capability of the animal, uh, what its form is like, and then also um, the, the amount of, of protein it produces. It's a genetic basis underneath all of that, and it's due to the random mutations that happen um, during evolution or selection, artificial selection. And while much of her work has involved wrangling these random DNA changes, Dr. Van Enenum's motivations are hardly clinical. Some of the work we're doing with them to try to select for animals that are less susceptible to disease and to try to minimize welfare issues like dehorning is really what interests me about animal breeding. And, and I think that genetics is a really um, sustainable approach to dealing with some of the problems of, of agriculture. Some of these challenges popped up long after cattle were domesticated. During the development of, of dairy cattle breeds, um, the horned trait came along. It wasn't necessarily something breeders were selecting for, but it is now fixed in the dairy breeds, for example, Holstein and, and, and Jersey. And it's not a trait that is optimally suited to modern production systems because the animals can hurt each other with the horns and they can also hurt the human handlers. So to prevent future harm, Dairy farmers often burn the growing horn buds off of male and female calves. It's done at a young age when the animals are one or two months old and it's painful when it's done. And so typically a lidocaine block is given to the animal before the heat is applied to the, to the horn bud. And so that's unpleasant and it's not something that is enjoyed by either the farmer or the, or the cow. Thankfully, not all breeds of cattle are given this procedure. As it happens, Angus have a naturally occurring mutation in their DNA that makes them not grow horns. So they're what's called polled, which means that they don't grow horns. It's a genetic defect, if you will. And of course, this leads to the question, why can't they get rid of the horn trait the old-fashioned way? You could cross an Angus over the top of a Holstein and get a polled, no horned calf, but you'd have this calf that was kind of half dairy and half beef and it wouldn't really be ideally suited to, to either. And then you'd have to cross it back to Holstein, to Holstein, to Holstein, to get it back to the high productivity of, of a typical Holstein. So by the time you did eight crosses, that's you know a 20 year process. And that's assuming the random genetic changes that come with traditional breeding methods work out in your favor. It's a process cattle breeders are not likely to adopt. So how do we make the Holsteins um, 
hornless. In the case of the bulls that we've been working with in collaboration with the company Recombinetics, the editing reagents were brought into cell culture and they went in and very precisely made a tweak in the DNA at the gene that grows horns to introduce exactly the same sequence as is found in Angus at that particular gene. So we introduced basically a cow sequence into a cow genome and then those cells were cloned and that's the two bulls that we have here on campus that are Holsteins that no longer grow horns. Dr. Van Inenem and her team at UC Davis is currently working on editing embryos in a similar manner, but it may be a while before bulls like these are ready for prime time. They're prototype animals. It wasn't done in an elite genetics line, it was really done more as, a, as an experimental proof of concept. So there's very elite animals that are at the top of the breeding pyramid. So for example, if you edited an elite Holstein, then all of the daughters that he produces would inherit that change. And so you could make improvements quite rapidly in, in a production system like that. Um, but how soon this technology might be seen in agricultural breeding programs really is 90% dependent on regulations and 10% dependent on scientists. <laughs> um, if there's uh, an overly arduous 20-year you know, time frame to bring it to market, then obviously that's going to make it cost prohibitive. Because the edit to the animal's DNA is identical to a random mutation during sexual reproduction, Dr. Van Enum doesn't believe this type of change merits legal oversight. We don't regulate that now. I mean, the reason that a Holstein looks different to an Angus is because of spontaneous mutations and evolution or selection, artificial selection. And so what's the rationale for, for regulating it if it's done by man versus the, if it occurs spontaneously? That, to me, there's no scientific rationale for that. It's just really, it's, it's an ethical, man shall not do that kind of statement. But she acknowledges that there is significant public concern about genetic modifications. If people's worries have to do with transgenesis or, you know, frankenfish or whatever, it's really a different technique to that. But I, I guess I would, would step back and ask, what is it that concerns you? Um, and and to, to understand where that, that discomfort is coming from. I mean, I, I don't think people would argue that it's better to burn off a horn than to genetically dehorn an animal. And so I'd like to have a discussion not only about risks, which is what the GMO discussion is only ever focused on, and discuss both benefits and risks. I'm Matt Cabus, and I run the marketing and business development for Amper Music. Amper is a video creator's first artificial intelligent music composer. This allows video creators to customize their own unique soundtracks to their videos without needing to know anything about music. When I hear a video director or somebody say, I want something that is epic and driving, well, as a composer, what do you think about when you hear that? How would you break that down? And that process of breaking some, an emotion down into something that, in, in, in codifying it, and teaching a computer not only that, but how to then learn, how to be creative and deliver you exactly what you want, that's essentially what the team had to do to have the app work as it does today. Amper is essentially not to replace composers by any means. In fact, musicians find benefit and value in actually using it whether you know, inspiring new songs or actually because of the way that the program works, you can you know, download a, a foundation of a song and then they can bring it into their DAW and build upon that. We believe that artificial intelligence and human beings are extraordinary collaborators. And with that, we'll further innovation in a way that we've never seen. We'll be able to create more than we ever have. This is a very exciting time. Every year, Florida becomes home to more than 60,000 loggerhead sea turtle nests. In 2016, the number of sea turtle nests was unexpectedly high. Scientists at Moat Marine Laboratory in Sarasota set out to learn why. Early every morning during the summer, an army of volunteers scatter across 35 miles of beaches in southwest Florida to find and identify sea turtle nests. This program is run by the Moat Marine Laboratory in Sarasota, Florida. We start at civil twilight, so very early, but when we can still see. And we're looking for the tracks of the mother turtle or babies if we have a hatch. So 
The mother turtle comes up. We can see her in track and her out track. We walk the entire thing. If we see signs of a nest, which will be kind of a flat area on the sand, a body pit area is what we call it, and a lot of scatter where she has swept sand with her front flippers over her eggs. Those are our clues. Jamie Schindelwolf is a volunteer for Moat Marine. And today she's giving a guided tour for 50 locals interested in sea turtle nesting on Longboat Key. She would have dug a hole with her back flippers somewhere in this area. We when a new nest is found, they first must verify that there are eggs. We clear off the top sand, that scatter, basically until we feel that the sand is hard. And then someone will very gently walk on the nest. And when they sink down into the sand, they know that that's most likely where the chamber is, and then they'll investigate further. And the eggs are pliable and down to the top egg. And then we'll stake it off so that people know a nest is there, so that we know, we triangulate it, and we GPS it as well. And then we will X out the crawl so that tomorrow's patrollers don't get confused and think it's a new nest. Data collection is at the heart of the research. On today's outing, the team excavates a nest that hatched three days earlier. All right, no flash. Very important, no flash. We did find six babies down there, and we got them out, and we put some wet sand in the bottom of a bucket and covered them up with a towel, so hopefully they will rest today before we let them out tonight after sunset. We went down, we counted the number of eggs that hatched, the number of eggs that were unhatched for whatever reason, we found a number down there that were pip dead, which means they are half out of the shell, but for whatever reason, they don't make it the rest of the way. Biologist Kristen Mazzarella uses the data to determine if conservation efforts are working. Six live, one dead, 73 hatched. We have 250 volunteers this year. We usually have a number of staff as well as uh, interns that are here being trained how to uh, find nests and take care of nests and conserve the nests. A female turtle returns to the area of her birth 30 years later to begin her first nesting season. The mother turtle is going to come up generally at night. When she finds a good spot on the beach, she starts digging. She moves all the dry sand off, the top layer of sand off, and then she starts using her back flippers to dig an egg chamber. And then when she's done, making that egg chamber, she's going to lay her eggs. After laying her eggs, the mother covers her nest and heads back to sea. There's an average of about 100 to 120 eggs in a loggerhead nest, which is 98% of our nests are loggerhead sea turtles on these beaches. They can vary from 10 eggs or one egg to 200 eggs, and so you never know what you're going to find inside those nests. A big part of the conservation effort is to educate local homeowners and beachgoers man-made lighting can cause big problems. The lighting from the homes are disorienting, sending the hatchlings and the mother turtles in the wrong direction. All this data has helped identify trends, and the news is good. The number of nests in 2016 are up, way up. Our lowest year was 2007. Uh, we had about 735 nests. Our highest year after that was last year, 2015, which was 2,475 nests. And then this year, we just broke 4,000 nests right now, and we're still having more nests being laid. But 30 years ago, it must have been a pretty good year with the number of nests and the number of hatchlings making it to the water and being successful out in the ocean for 30 years. Moat Marine Labs also provides a rehabilitation center for sick and injured sea turtles. Sometimes that includes baby turtles. Some of the most common things that we have come into us here are um, just hatchlings that are disorientated, so they end up following the brightest light. Today, sometimes the brightest light is the traffic lights or condos, and hatchlings end up getting disorientated, and we find them in parking lots or up stuck in the dunes. As an aquarium biologist, Holly West understands the hatchlings' instincts kick in when they hit the water. Once they enter the water, a hatchling goes through what we call a swim frenzy and that swim frenzy is usually about three days long and it is designed to get them as far offshore as possible away from that predator zone or that inshore area. Um, and so if they end up doing that three days of swimming in a swimming pool or in a stormwater drain, we can't release them on the beaches anymore. So the guys that are here right now are actually gonna get a free ride out to the weed line when we can find a boat to get them out there. 
Injured and sick adult sea turtles are cared for by Lynn Bird, the medical care and rehabilitation coordinator here. All the species of sea turtles we deal with are threatened or endangered, um, and so we bring them in, and our goal obviously is to rehabilitate and put them back out into the wild. Meet Bellatrix, a Kemp's Ridley sea turtle who was caught on a line by fishermen. They did do the right thing. They brought her in for rehab, um, and we were unable to in the hospital to remove that hook, and it did such severe damage to her lung, it actually collapsed uh, her right lung and so she's not able to be put back into the wild. We just wanted to make sure she was doing okay, so we just did routine blood work, took some radiographs, um, weighed her to make sure she's gaining enough weight. Um, we did some regular measurements to follow her growth. And this is Avalon, a green turtle who was injured in the Atlantic. Obviously she has boat prop wounds on her back, so a lot of times when turtles get sick, they overinflate their lungs and they're fine floating on the surface and they're either taken out by predators or they're more vulnerable to boat strikes. And she has developed tumors on her shell. They're called fibropapilloma tumors. Um, all we know about them is they're caused by a herpes virus. We do know it comes out in times of stress. So long as they don't have internal tumors, we can uh, remove those external tumors. Once they're healed, they can be put back out into the wild. The scientists and volunteers who work with these magnificent creatures are all dedicated to preserving the species for future generations. We care about these individual animals because without the individuals, we don't have a population. And if these populations go, um, it's going to just spiral down. I'm not studying to be a you know a marine scientist or anything like that, but it's cool to be kind of a citizen scientist and just really be at the forefront of this kind of research. I would love to see that the turtle nesting doesn't decline and that we continue to see an increase. That in 30 years, my impact is, is, is being still seen as I'm seeing the impact of people who started 30 years before me. I'm Daniela Perdomo, I'm co-founder of Gotenna. And I'm uh, Jay Perdomo, also co-founder of <laughs> Gotenna. We started the company four years ago and we actually just released our second product, which is called Gotenna Mesh. This device pairs to your phone and allows you to communicate even when you don't have service. So it allows you to send texts and GPS locations over many miles. It creates its own radio signal that then forms into its own network out in the field that we built from the ground up. I think it's more like a tactical radio, kind of like military grade, but we've made it a lot smaller, easier, and you know, accessible to kind of the general consumer population. Our phones are communications devices, but if you don't have service because you're out in a remote area or disaster hits or any other reason for why you don't have cell service or Wi-Fi or so forth, we wanted to create a way to allow people to continue to communicate even you know, when they didn't have any central infrastructure. What's really cool about this product is that, let's say Jay and I are hiking somewhere and he's you know, out of range of me, if someone else has GoTenna mesh between us, I can send their, my message through them automatically and privately. You might attach it to a backpack, you can put it in a pocket. I mean, it's really small, it weighs 1.7 ounces. It's everything from if you're going out hiking, spending time outdoors, crowded events, travel abroad, and emergency preparedness is another use case as well. You need some kind of iOS or Android device, but what's nice about that is that we designed it with an app that looks kind of just like an iMessage or WhatsApp mixed with the Google Maps, so you don't need to like learn how to use it. We want it to be something very natural so people can continue to communicate the way they normally do, like over text and GPS and so forth. You use it the way you normally would use your phone, except it work, this makes it work when it otherwise can't. Our first product you can buy at REI and on Amazon and everything, but our second product we just launched for pre-order last week, and so you can get it on pre-order right now for you know discount pricing before we start shipping later this month. You can watch full episodes of SciTech Now on demand and on WPSU's YouTube channel. I'm Mike Zeman. Thanks for watching. Funding for this program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Sue and Edgar Wachenheim III, and contributions to this station.